There was a brother who, uh, who used to watch the videos that the Lord hath given me to do, who um, did a really short video. I, I forget this brother's name. Um, he is of Hispanic uh, descent, um, wears really big, thick glasses. I can't remember his name. Um, but he did a really short, powerful, powerful video where he opened up the and he and this brother he was more just speaking to you he he did not use the scriptures in that video to, uh, to my recollection it was something like only a four or eight minute video something like that but he asked this question how do you pray when do you pray and the video like I said I, I don't think the brother used uh, scripture at all in that video, but he just, you know, sharing things with you about prayer, about prayer. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. And follow me along, word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures that we are going to be looking at today. This is not going to be as structured as a video as have been. Um, uh, there are do have some notes things that the Lord has given me to uh, speak about so kind of it's going to be a little structure some rabbit trails here along the way but please get the scriptures follow me along don't just sit there on your duff doing nothing okay follow me along check me out in the scriptures keep me accountable Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. If there comes a part within the video that you don't understand it, pause it and read even more of the context. Remember, context is likened onto a sandwich. You got the bread, the bread, and then you got the stuff in the middle of the sandwich. Okay, so the whole context, the whole sandwich, okay? But if there comes a point where you, uh, we read, a, because we got a couple of one verse uh, references here in this that we're going to go through but um, pause the video and read the context yourself follow along in the scriptures it's very important okay we're going to begin James James a book written specifically for the Jewish people the Hebraic people during the time of Jacob's trouble there are doctrines that cross dispensational lines but the book in its entirety is specifically for the Hebraic Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble doctrinally on the whole on the whole it does not apply for us today doctrinally on the whole like I said there are things that cross dispensational lines here within the book of James some not all you gotta remember okay the whole book is written for us but it's not written not all of it is written to us. Okay, you gotta remember that. James chapter 5, verses 16 on to verse 17. Uh, verses 16 on to verse 18. And right away, the Bibles messed this up. And the Catholics messed this up to justify you going to a Jesuit priest and confessing all your sins to him and wouldn't you know it you look this up in history here's a little bit of that rabbit uh, the Jesuits used the confessions to get secrets to expose secrets and stuff like that the the confession is wicked sinful you don't confess your sins to a man you confess confess your sins to the Lord okay but, like I said, the Bibles really messed this verse up. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Righteous man. How are you righteous? 
because of what you do, keeping the law today in a dispensation where we are not required to keep the law to be saved, stay saved, or be righteous in the sight of God, huh? Like that heretic devil Mark the Messenger teaches you that you've got to keep the law today in order to stay saved. That's heresy. Okay, he's a lying devil. Perfect example. The righteousness that that man has is his own righteousness. Well, I do this, I do that. Or is your righteousness that uh, is your that had that you have is it yours or is it the Lord's? Second Corinthians, of course, chapter five. Second Corinthians, chapter five, verse twenty-one. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Imputed righteousness. When you come to the Lord on His terms and not your own. Lord willing, we're going to address this thing about you're a good person, huh? Yeah. We're going to address that this Monday. Lord willing. Lord willing. Okay? But, your righteousness. Your righteousness or the Lord's righteousness? Hmm. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And also, um, um, dispensationally and doctrinally, like we said, the book of James is written for the Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble. So they're going to be keeping the law during that dispensation of the time of Jacob's trouble. It's faith and works. They've got to have faith in what God is going to do, that he's going to come back. Okay? One second, brethren. Pardon me, I forgot to silence my hell phone. But yes, it's faith and works during the time of Jacob's trouble. And they have to have faith, the Hebraic people have to have faith that Jesus will come. His second coming. Okay? But, confess your faults one to another. I have a fault that I have to confess to you. A beloved brother of mine, of ours, rebuked me, uh, Yesterday, I think it was. Today is Friday the 2nd. was either uh, yesterday or Wednesday. Uh, but I got a rebuke from a brother. In videos when talking about that man of sin, the son of perdition, I often say to you that he's going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. That, that is my opinion. Okay? Scripturally, I'm confessing a fault. Scripturally, you cannot prove, I cannot prove to you scripturally that the son of perdition is going to look like the effeminate, good-looking, long-haired uh, Roman Catholic Jesus. Scripturally, I cannot prove that. I have scriptural reasons why I say that the, I believe that that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. Um, for example, uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, okay, like I said, not going to be that, this video is not going to be all that structured, okay? Got some rabbit trails that we're going to be getting into, okay? But Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 and 3, verses 1 on to verse 3, Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And then some people like to say of this, well, that's only specifically talking about when he's on the cross. And they can, and this is legitimate. They can, they go to Isaiah 52 about in verse 14 as many as were astonished at the his visage his face was so marred more than any man in his form his body more than the sons of men and that's true but but okay now let's continue here in Isaiah chapter 53 and let's read verse 3 <clears throat> he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So see, in context here, verse 2 is not where it says there is no beauty in him. It's not specifically 
only relegated to the mention of how he looked on the cross. What are we getting at? The Jesus Christ of the authorized version of the scriptures was not a beautiful one to look to. In Matthew, Matthew chapter uh, 13, Matthew chapter 13, just one verse here, Matthew chapter 13, okay, if you want context, pause it and read the sandwich on your own time, okay, but Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, what those people who doubted our Lord said of him, is not this the carpenter's son, the carpenter's son, is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Shimon and Judas, carpenter's son. He was the carpenter's son. He wasn't anything to look. He was a man's man. You know, when you get right down to it, we don't know what Jesus Christ actually looked like. But Satan through Roman Catholicism, has painted this portrait of this beautiful, some even mostly effeminate looking Jesus. Okay? There are some out there that uh, uh, put into their depictions of Jesus uh, some Hebraic uh, Shemitic features because salvation is of the Jews, obviously. But still, the pictures that you see by man of Je this Jesus are always attractive, always good looking. I know there was one documentary uh, where they did a computerized thing that what Jesus looked like. And it, I remember that. He, he, he had that uh, deer in the headlights look like that heretic Mark the Messenger does in all his videos. Uh, but uh, it, the the computer generated thing was ugly. It was like wow. I tell you that was probably more realistic to the way that Jesus may have actually looked in reality. Brad, you're saying that our Savior is ugly? That's what we just saw in the scriptures. That's what the scripture says. That the world didn't see any beauty in him, and they didn't esteem him. If Jesus were to walk by you on the street, you wouldn't notice him. But see, the Roman Catholic Jesus, that beautiful looking one, oh, you'd notice him. And of course, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 on to verse 15, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And then you read Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verses 11 on to verse 19 talks about how Satan was adorned with every precious stone and he was uh, deceived by his own brightness because he was so beautiful. He was so beautiful. Yeah. And also, we know that the son of perdition, he's also going to be what Satan hates the most. The Jews, the Hebraic people. That's why a lot of them out there, like that heretic Mark the Messenger, and the Roman Catholic Church, who say they are Jews and they are not. And we've talked about this before. The, the Catholics do not say we are Jewish. But they plainly, openly teach replacement theology. So they are saying that they are the chosen ones. <laughs> Just like Mark the Messenger does. And he does it because his skin color is black. Oh, Brad, you betcha. You betcha. That Mark the Messenger is probably one of the most racist people or kindred favoring people you will ever meet or ever see here on YouTube. Okay? Put that in your pipe and smoke it, pal. Yeah. Yeah. But, that man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to be a Hebrew. And when I say to you that I have many videos, like my brother uh, called me on. I believe that the son of perdition is going to look like the effeminate looking Roman Catholic Jesus. If I, uh, if I do not preference it, preface that with I think, or if I was a betting man, if I have given to you any, uh, like this, like I'm teaching that doctrinally, I repent, forgive me. 
I'm sorry. I cannot prove to you through scripture that that man of sin, the son of perdition, is actually going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. But what, as I just told you, I base that upon scripture, but I can't prove it through scripture. You know what I mean? It doesn't say anywhere that he's going to be this effeminate looking guy like the Roman Catholic Jesus. But how are people going to recognize him? It's like, oh, wow. That's why I base that with where I base that upon. Okay? And you know what? Going forward, I am going to say, I think, I believe that the Roman, that the uh, son of perdition is going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. Brother, thank you for that rebuke. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I love you. Thank you very much. I just confessed a fault to you. Okay? I did. That is my opinion. And Lord willing, going forward, I'm, I thought I always did, but apparently I didn't. But going forward, I'm going to make sure, I at least try to remember, I believe or I think, it is my opinion that the son of perdition is going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. Okay? But see? Yeah, little rabbit there. Good with Tabasco sauce or teriyaki. But, go back to James chapter 5. Confess your faults one to another. I just did. Forgive me for that. Please. Thank you. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And again, where comes your righteousness? From what you do? Or from the risen Lord and Savior, our God, our Father, Jesus Christ. And it says, pray one for another that ye may be healed. When do you pray? How do you pray? Are you the focal point of your prayers? Hey, there, there's nothing wrong with prayer. You know, we are to you know, cast all our care upon Him, for He careth for us. Absolutely. And He knows what we need before we go to Him. Yes, He does. See, it's the relationship of, of you speaking unto our, your Father, our God, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer ought not to be a typed, written statement that you just mechanically... Ba, 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 ba. No, that, that's not prayer. That's, that's uttering statements. At, that's speaking at someone. Not speaking with someone. And then someone, well, God doesn't speak to me audibly. And no. But he speaks to your heart. You know, you know a good way to have the Lord speak to you? The scriptures, okay? And if you want to hear him speak to you uh, audibly, read out loud. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay? I pray one for another that you may be healed. Uh, before, I, uh, before I forget about prayer requests, uh, there is a brother from North Dakota who is, is moving right now. And this dear brother, he's he's not crippled, but he's debilitated with pain that the Jesuit doctors don't want to properly um, diagnose and treat. Um, he's in an apartment building, and he's moving from one to another. They're just remodeling, but they're giving him a new place. And he's got a he's got a helper to help him with it, but he's got a lot to do. So please keep your, our brother from North Dakota in your prayers that the move goes smoothly. Please keep him in your prayers. Also my best friend, our beloved brother Alexander Hartley, who is honoring his mother according to the scriptures. And unfortunately his mother is on the way out. And he is privy to see such. He's seen the decline. And he's doing things that, in caring for his mother, that most of us wouldn't do. And the enemy is, is attacking him too. Please keep our brother Alexander Hartley in your prayers. He needs all the prayers you can, can give him, brethren. He needs it. He needs it. Because he is going through, he is... He's seen his mother dying before his very eyes. 
And um, I know what that's like. I know what that's like because I've been there myself. And he's seen it himself. He's in that position. So please keep him in your prayers. Please pray for him. So there's a brother from out northeast, uh, northeast of us from New Jersey who's alone. He does have some uh, brethren around him, but the enemy is attacking him constantly. And he suffers from loneliness. Please keep him in your prayers. Okay? Just, just to name a few. Just to name a few. Pray for one another, brethren. And, you know, there's a way we can pray. You know, the, Lord, I don't know what they need. You do. Please provide for so-and-so as they need. You know, we do that. I do that. But if you have the means to converse with someone via email or whatnot, it's like, hey, brother, sister, how can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? You might say, well, the Lord will reveal to you how you ought to pray for people. And that's true. That's true. But sometimes... You see this with Elisha, okay? When the lady came, or the the lady came to his feet, and Gehazi went to shoo her away, and uh, Elisha said, no, "No, no, 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 don't. There's something wrong here, but the Lord has hid it from me because of that personal one-on-one -on -one that he was to have with that woman." Sometimes, you know what, brethren? There might be a brother out there or a sister who, okay. You, you're praying for so-and-so. You know, you're praying. We do this, don't we? It's like, uh, Lord, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what he needs. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how he's doing, but you do. Please provide for him as you know he needs. Uh, there's uh, my one brother from Iowa, uh, or Idaho. I'm sorry if I get that messed up, um, who I haven't talked to in a while, you know. Don't know what's going on there with him. My brother from Norway. Who is a really busy man, you know? And through emails, got a, a, you know, an idea how to pray for. But, you know, still, it's like, you know, sometimes you got to reach out to your brethren and sisters. You know, sometimes you do. Sometimes the Lord wants you to. To pray for one another. To pray for one another. And also, what does it say? The effectual... Fervent, fervent, excuse me, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Again, whose righteousness? Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. Let's read, let's close this up. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him. Now remember, that is playing on to the fact that this book, uh, James, is specifically written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Because during the time of Jacob's trouble, there is no eternal security except... For the 144,000 Jews descended from Shem of the Hebraic line. Okay? Not a Hamite and not a Japhethian. Okay? Or Japhethite, whatever you want to say. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And of course, that, verses 19 and 20, is a what? That's works for a dispensation that is faith and works. Okay? Okay? How many of you have heard from these Christians where they go to verse 19 and 20? Okay? To convert this, uh, to, what is this? To con uh, convert the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And shall hide a multitude of his sins? Are we the ones saving souls today? No, that's up to the Lord. 
that's dispensational specific. But for our instruction in righteousness, okay, and hide a multitude of sins, but for our instruction in righteousness, we the appropriate way unto a brother or a sister, you know, hey brother, you, there's something that you said or something that you might believe or think, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about it through scripture. But when you get rebuked, like I said, my dear brother, my young brother from Croatia, he rebuked me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Also, please keep our young brother uh, from Croatia in your prayers. Um, he, he's up and down. He's doing his best with his health. But his health is up and down, up and down. Poor, poor young man. Poor young man as far as his health is concerned. And he's, he's got no choice. He's surrounded by Catholics. Please keep him in your prayers. And also, too, the Lord might have give uh, might have put a woman in the the mists for him. Hope so, brother. But then again, here, well, why are we looking at this prayer? Effectual, fervent prayer, never never to faint. And Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And as uh, Leonard Ravenhill did, and he prayed, but he stopped there. He prayed. How do you pray? Why do you pray? Hmm. No man except the Lord <laughs> has the right to tell you how to pray. And personally, I do not believe at all in this nonsense of unanswered prayer I don't I, I I don't I don't believe that I don't believe that um, if it's either yes no or silence right silence is also an answer to prayer our Lord is a Lord who answers prayer if you are not saved born again converted of the church of the living God who are you praying to you're praying to the little G God of this world. But see, if you come to the Lord on His terms and He save you by His grace through your faith, you are His. And our Father answers our prayers. It might not be what you want to hear. It might not be the way you like it or want it. Like these Christian prosperity scumbags. I'm being polite. Who twist the scriptures. It's like... Pray for an automobile or pray for a woman for lustful things. Oh, shut up. Shut up. We pray according to his will. His will. Well, it's his will that you have the finest of life. Uh, that leads to covetousness. Our Father hates, abhors the covetous. He abhors it. What is that? That's Psalm 10? I believe that's in Psalm 10? One of you, I'm sure, will uh, put that in the uh, description box or in the comments section, right? Our Lord abhors covetousness. If we, if we pray like John, 1 John 5 says, if we pray according to His will, we know He hears us. But see, if we pray not according to His will and He's silent to us or says no, we still get an answer. The Lord doesn't answer the prayers of those who are not His. Sometimes He does if they are truly, genuinely seeking Him. Yes. If He's guiding those people unto Himself and they are in the process of the breaking. Yes. Yes. But otherwise, who's answering the prayer? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 under verse 6. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherein I think, it, think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Again, 
you do not fight fire with fire. Because if you fight fire with fire, fire will win. Don't, over, don't overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. If you f overcome evil with evil, evil is going to win. What is the, the, the sword of the spirit? This is the mightiest, deadliest weapon on the face of this earth. The authorized version of the scriptures. But how do we wage our war? Now again, if someone's going to attack you with a baseball bat or try to run you over in a car in a drunken stupor, defend yourself, okay? Depraved indifference is sin, okay? But we do not go at warfare in fleshly matters. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carne, carnal, fleshly but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Physical strongholds? Mental strongholds? Spiritual strongholds? Yeah. Strongholds. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations. It's a figment of your imagination. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness and having in a readiness excuse me to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled hmm. perfect example of this of pulling down strongholds and casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God perfect example Easy believism. It's a stronghold. I'm, I can't tell you how many times I've run into this. I'm saved because I just believe. Then you talk with these Christians. And all the time, when you run into these Christians who are just believe, every single time without exception, in personal experience, when you speak with them, about there is none good, no, not one, and that Lord willing that we will address that on Monday. Lord willing, okay? But, you know, there is none good, no, not one. And then you bring up examples and talk about that. Sooner or later, with these people who say, who, uh, who have a stronghold of, I'm saved because I just believed. Sooner or later, well, I'm not as bad as so and so. Every, every single time, every single time, without exception, with these easy believism heretic devil scumbags who are damning people to hell. Okay? Damning people to hell. Every time, without exception. Bring, bring up Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay? Bring up Jeffrey Dahmer, who I also believe is in heaven. Okay? Bring him up. Oh, oh, you'll see that. You'll see, like we read in James. Whose righteousness? Your righteousness because you just believed? Or that God, or that this is a, a worthy, uh, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief? Whose righteousness are you boasting about? Hmm? You're boasting, huh? Yeah, easy believism is a stronghold. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And see, carnal there, fleshly, and strongholds. Again, the perfect example is easy believism. I'm saved, foot planted, chest out, chin up. I'm saved because I just believe. But what about brokenness? What about brokenness? Well, we're all sinners. And that's true. See, what happens is, when you got someone like that, they, they hide themselves under the umbrella 
that we're all sinners. Okay? But yet when you press them on it, they want to hide under that umbrella for covering of we're all sinners, but yet exclude themselves as being a sinner. Hence, like I said, every single time, without an exception, talking with these easy believism Christians, every single time, every single time, when you get around to it, sooner or later, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, and you expect me to think that you're saved, born again, converted up to the church of the living God? No, you go on being a Christian. You go on being a Christian. Only believe? Yeah. Yeah. What about God's grace? Oh! Oh! You're elect! <laughs> or not elect! <laughs> see? See, brethren? See? Casting, uh, uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through, the, through God to the pulling down of strongholds strongholds like Calvinism and what that devil heretic Mark the Messenger teaches is just another form of Calvinism elect and non-elect and he teaches that the Hamites are the chosen people in this dispensation the chosen people are the ones who go the way God chose what way is that? The way of the cross. But as far as election, the apple of God's eye is the Hebraic Jewish people, which I, being of Japheth, am not, and which Mark, the mess of Satan, is not either. He's of Ham. Okay? Another stronghold. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Weapons of our warfare? Well, here's a good verse for you. Hebrews chapter, what is that? Hebrews chapter 412. Remember the address. Uh, uh, wait, 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 is that? <laughs> oh, oh, I, I just uh, forgot the address myself. <laughs> One second. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Yes, it is Hebrews 412. I was looking at verse 16. Hebrews 412. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And you know what? When you read the scriptures, especially in the Psalms, you see a lot of prayers within the Psalms. There are those out there who say that the Psalms are the, was the prayer book of the Jewish people. I believe that. Because when you read the Psalms, there's a whole bunch of prayers within the Psalms. And the closest thing that you're ever going to get to a um, prayer of salvation within the Scriptures is Psalm 51. Okay? That's the closest you're going to get. Here in the Apocrypha, they have the prayer of Manasseh. Uh, remember, the Apocrypha is not inspired Scripture. Uh, the Apocrypha is where Catholicism gets all their doctrine. Okay? But see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty and pulling down strongholds and casting down imaginations, right? We use the scriptures and prayer. And prayer. Because why? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Whose righteousness, though? That's the question. How do you pray? Why do you? What do you pray? I know there's a, a lot of my countrymen who like to say, you know, you got to pray for America, that America will be great again. <laughs> when was America ever great? Give me a break, people. Ah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there are those out there who preach that a revival is going to come. A revival. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Second Chronicles chapter 7. Okay, We've gone over these before, but 
What the Lord has shared with me and put upon my heart, I am sharing with you. Okay? Besides, so we need to be reminded of these things, brethren. This is the sword of the Spirit. This is the mightiest, deadliest weapon known to man. But another weapons of our warfare, remember that's plural, doesn't say the weapon of our warfare, the weapons. We got the sword of the Spirit, number one. Number two, prayer, conversing with the living God. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, <laughs> uh, this is specifically talking about the Jews. And if, on the, okay, now remember I, at the beginning about how I said about, you know, the context? Pause this video. Pause this video. Read 2 Chronicles 7. It's only 22 verses. Okay? I'm not going to read it here today. But read it, the whole thing. And for those of you who want to take, come to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and we're going to be reading verses 12 on to verse 20, and say that this is America, this applies for America, you're crazy. You're crazy. You have to read the entire chapter to see what Solomon did, what Solomon gave, what it cost. And that is a cost, dear friend, that Americans... And, most, it does, and this doesn't matter what nation uh, on earth that you are in. It doesn't matter. Your countrymen don't want to pay the price. The cost. The sacrifice that Solomon gave. Because when you get right down to it, the sacrifice will have to be those sacrifices of things of yourself and it's always sin and people love their sin more than they love God but Second Chronicles chapter 7 verses 12 under verse 20 and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice if I shut up heaven that there be no rain or if I command the locusts to devour the land and if I send pestilence among the people, and here's where they go to. If my people which are called by my name, you Christians, you're not called by his name. What, what Christ? What Christ are you representing? Remember, and thank you for the one brother putting the definition in the one video about what Christ means. Christ, you can prove this through scripture, means anointed one. Okay, you don't need Mr. Webster's dictionary to prove that Christ means anointed one. But Christ, that's what Christ means. Okay? Okay? Uh, Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is come in the flesh? God manifests in the flesh? Or that anointed one of Satan? That man of sin, the son of perdition. What Christ? Okay? If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, Oh, you'll give up this, this, and the other thing. But yet, your heart still goes after your covetousness. And see, it's the humbling of themselves. And pray. And seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Repent. Then will I hear from heaven. And will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. Now mine eyes shall be opened. And my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Different dispensation. They had a temple where they went to, okay? Totally different dispensation. Today, the church buildings is not where you go to meet God. Okay? You can meet God in your bedroom, in your bathroom, wherever, at the Demokami uh, convention. It doesn't matter. Okay? You don't go to a church building, God forbid, to seek God. You go to a church building to seek the little G God of this world. That's where you go to. The little G God of this world who tells you, and amen, Brother Diego. Amen, amen to this. To the church buildings to hear, you're a good person. God's not angry at you. God loves you unconditionally, even though you are a sinner rejecting him, a lost sinner rejecting him. 
Oh, and then you y'all can quote to me Ezekiel chapter 18 all day till you're blue in the face. Yes, God would rather wants to see the wicked get saved. But see, they have to come to repentance. And the repentance, okay? Hey, you know, there are some sins people can give up. There are. You can't give up all your sins. You, you couldn't do that at gunpoint. You couldn't give up all your sins even if you tried. The repentance is of, you're a good person, huh? Yeah, right. That's the repentance that you have to repent of. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. As so you think Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven and you think I'm lost? I'm better than he is. Every time with them easy believe is heretics, man. That's the repentance. That's the repentance. <clears throat> now mine eyes, verse 15, Now mine eyes shall be open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name shall be there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And as for thee, if thou wilt walk before me, take, you know what, you, you, know, you, you take, take your little pen, if, if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, and do according to all that I have commanded thee, and shalt observe my statutes and my judgments, different dispensation, faith and works, under the law, okay? Then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom, according as I have covenanted with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. But if, if circle the if, a uh, young brother, Marking, you, you are marking the ifs, right? And if ye turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, go out a whoring, then will I pluck them up by the roots out of my land which I have given them and this house which I have sanctified by my name will I cast out of my sight and I will make it a, to be a proverb and a byword among all nations. Looking at that verse 14. And if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and shall seek my face and turn from their wickedness, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and heal their land, and will heal their land. Charismatics like to say the latter rain movement. And they say that there's a great revival coming. The latter rain movement, which the Lord had me to do a video on, when you look into the scriptures about the latter rain, it is always in context to the Hebraic Jewish people. The latter rain that the scriptures talk about has nothing to do with us today in this dispensation. It's about future fulfillment for the Jewish people. It doesn't apply for us today. Watch out for those charismatics that say, latter rain, he's going to send the latter rain, that there's going to be a mighty revival coming. I have said, even in that video about the latter rain, I uh, get the, the, the latter, I've got to write this down, uh, latter rain, so as link in the description box. There isn't going to be a revival as, as concerning all of America, all of the world. Turn to the authorized version of the scriptures. Turn to the God of the scriptures. It's not happening. It's not happening. There is not going to be a return or revival onto truth. Now, individually, yes. Oh yes, that can happen. Yes. What does revive mean? Bring back to life. They're dead in trespasses and sins. Okay? But individually... Yes, you can have a revival. Yes, you can, individually. Maybe maybe a small little congregation of people. Maybe even upwards to 100 people. But on a national world scale, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Okay? And, and we have, 
you know, we have plenty of witness to this that there isn't going to be a revival, a return to truth. But you know what? Satan, through his church, Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, and all her daughters, like Islam, like Moronism, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, like Easy Believism, like Calvinism. <gasps> yeah. 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 There's going to be a revival of evil. And that one documentary, Revival of Evil, which YouTube will not let me upload because it's a copyrighted thing. Beneficial unto the Church of the Living God, Body of Christ. Some vexing things in there. Uh, uh, what's that guy who uh, hunts in there? You know, about the, uh, the woman rights, the beast. Uh, if I can remember, I'll link that in the description box. That is worth watching. I tried to upload it on the channel, but they wouldn't let me. Okay? But there's going to be a revival of evil. This false religion this Christianity. Yes. There will be a revival. Yes, there will. Not a revival as to returning onto the truth of the scriptures. Because what, 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 what do we see? Okay? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1, on to verse 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils like Mark the Messenger. Okay? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared for with a hot iron. And also, you know, doctrines of devils. Okay? Doctrines of devils. Easy believism. Ecumenicalism. That there are many paths to God. That God is okay with you. Never mind. I'm not even going to go there yet. Okay? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Oh, this has Mark the Messenger written all over it. Brad, why are you, uh, or as the one email, you're going after Mark the Messenger because he's black. The Lord rebuke you, you devil. You shut your mouth and go take a long walk off of a short pier. Mark the Messenger is a very perfect example of heresy because he's very popular and a lot of his disciples are to defend him, don't judge, and blah, 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 blah. But he is a perfect example of someone who is, number one, against the redemption of the purchased possession. Number two, he's against once saved, always saved. And number three, he preaches that today, that you have to keep the law to stay saved. Hence, number four, he doesn't rightly divide the word of truth. He is a perfect example of that type of heresy. That's why I keep mentioning him. Okay? All right? That's why. He's a perfect example of it. Perfect. He fits that example of, he fits that perfectly. Okay? He does. He really does. He really does. Okay? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, like pork, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, right away we think of Catholics and their Lent, right? Exactly. But it is deeper than that. Okay? A lot of the Islam, Islamic people uh, don't eat pork. Okay? And a lot of other people. It's, whatever they got against pig, I don't know. I, I like me some back bacon, eh? <laughs> I like me bacon. I like pork chops. We, we, we just had pork last night. Oh, very good. Very good. But, now see, here's the thing of rightly dividing the word of truth. Under the dispensation of the law, Eating pork was not allowed. Another dispensation. But in this dispensation, verse 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. Why? For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And prayer. What does this mean? You can eat pork today. You can eat pork today. If you don't want to, good for you. You're missing out, but good for you. If you want to keep kosher, good for you. It's not pertinent to your salvation, though. Okay? And also, uh, 1 Timothy 5, verses 3 and 5, on the verse 5. 
Oh, uh, is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, wait, 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 wait. What am I? What am I looking at? <laughs> okay, never mind. Never mind. Never mind what I just said. Now, uh, go to. Uh, yeah, it was uh, First Timothy chapter six. Wrote down the wrong thing. Okay. First Timothy chapter six, verses three on to verse five. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, separation. He is proud, knowing nothing, and doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Gain is godliness. Whether it means money, whether it means property, whether it means a fan base, whatever. So people are going to be departing from the faith and giving uh, heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, saying gain is godliness. Okay, and also verses nine and ten in Second uh, First Timothy chapter six. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Hell. Mm -hmm. Why? For the love of money is the root of all evil. You pompous. Arrogant little baby boy. Yeah, yeah. By which lives by Notre Dame. Yeah, you arrogant little baby boy. Yeah. Sorry, I had to mention that devil. Sorry. Okay. But for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, and the Lord abhorreth the covetous. They have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Also, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, no, excuse me, why did I write down all these wrong, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, okay, I wrote down the wrong numbers, beg your pardon. This know also that in the last, day, in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. So they're going to uh, take heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Gain is godliness. They're going to love money. Mm. Tell me you don't see this going on right now. Especially, especially amongst the Christians. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, which Christianity bases, bases, is based off of, covetousness. You're a good person. God's not angry at you. God loves you unconditionally. Then they go to Ezekiel 18 and like to jump over just like the easy believism heretic. Repentance. Repentance of yourself. Okay? For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And right away I think of my beloved best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Truce, break truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Yeah, you want to see fierceness? Hey, Jesus Christ is God the Father. A, uh, a Trinitarian? He is not the Father! Whoa! Whoa, boy, did I just fart in your general direction or something? <laughs> Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Lovers of pleasures. More than lovers of God. And is that not what Christianity offers you? Or in the perverse fashion, lovers of pleasures by 
uh, disallowing pleasures, by putting yourself under a system of bondage to uh, deny yourself pleasures, okay? But yet, in doing so, you get to boast yourself because you do such. Go figure that one out. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. People are lovers of sin more than God. Having a form of godliness. Having a form of it. But denying the power thereof from such turn away. And of course, and of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, <laughs> of course, Titus Titus chapter 1 verse 16 They profess that they know God but in works they deny him being abominable, abominable and disobedient and on to every good work reprobate. And then the twisting and the conniving their ways are movable of the easy believism heretics like oh you're saying they got to work to be saved. Shut up. Shut up. What do you think you're doing? Yeah. And of course Second Timothy and I wrote that one down right. <laughs> Verses 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Christianity. How many of you Christians? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. <laughs> but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned on to faith. What we just looked at is ample evidence and proof that in the last days, before the redemption of the purchased possession, there ain't going to be no revival. People are not going to return to truth. But rather, what are they going to do? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned on to fables. And then, of course, in Isaiah, I believe that's 29 or 30, uh, speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Get ye out of the way. Okay? <laughs> Don't tell us of this Holy One of Israel. Okay? It's not going to be a returning on to truth. But people are going to be turned on to fables. Under the dispensation of the law, you had to keep the commandments in order to be saved, right with God and stay saved. And if you messed up once, you messed up the whole thing. Faith and works. No eternal security under the law. That was truth for that dispensation. But then you got guys coming around today in this dispensation where you do not have to keep the law to be saved, stay saved, or be right with God. It is by His grace through our faith that we are saved. Okay? Because we go to Him, His chosen way of the cross. Okay? And us Gentiles being grafted into the tree of the Jew. Okay? We're not Jews. Okay? Jews are Jews. Okay? We did a whole video on those. Uh, Two-part video on that. Okay? Jews are Jews. You know, Hebrews. Scripturally uh, equated with the Jews. Watch the video in the link. Okay? Okay? We're not Jews. We're not Hebrews. But we're grafted in. Okay? Different dispensation. All right? Fables. That you got to keep the law today to be saved. Okay? It's a fable. It's truth in and of itself, but for a different dispensation. Not pertinent for salvation today. You're saved by your belief. Only believe. Just believe. What about His grace? See, what they do is they skip over repentance. Contrition. Contrition is godly sorrow. I put Christ on the cross. I ha held the hammer and hit the nail. Brad, no you didn't. Yes, I did. He died because of me. My fault. But you easy believers and guys especially. Well, I'm not as bad as I'm not as bad as you are, Brad. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. And see, Philippians chapter 2, just one verse, just one verse, Philippians chapter 2, 
Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, or excuse me, verse 21. Wow, I wrote down all the wrong references here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Why do you pray? How do you pray? When do you pray? Now, like, I, like we said, we can go to prayer. Absolutely. We put our petitions for, before the Lord. Absolutely. Like, I, I had the opportunity to speak to a brother uh, recently, and, and this is true. Uh, you know, when you go into prayer, uh, how many times do you end up realizing it's like, wow, Lord, I, I, how many times do I got to say I'm sorry? I'm sorry for being so wicked. I'm sorry that I'm such a sinner who is chief. <laughs> right? Right? Well, I, I've got nothing to apologize to the Lord for after he saved me. Then you ain't saved. What? You're sinlessly perfect, huh? I've run into that. I don't ask for forgiveness. He saved me. What do I have? So then you're sinlessly perfect. You're lost. You're, you're not saved. Go away from me. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Okay? Really? But yeah, you know? <laughs> In prayer. You know, Lord, thank you. You've given me today. Lord, why are you so merciful to me? I'm a sinner who is chief. Lord, forgive me for these thoughts. For... Or, you know, I shouldn't have done that, but I did this. I should have done did this, but I did that. Uh, Lord, I didn't say it enough. I, Lord, I said too much. Lord, why do you, you know? Amen. You end up, you end up for, a, um, uh, for a time in prayer. It's like, Lord, forgive me. Why is that? Uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, you know? Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, the script set of scriptures is almost getting almost getting worn in, brother. Almost, <laughs> almost. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter one. What is this? Verse eighteen. For in much wisdom is much grief. Wisdom, and unto man he said, the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. In much wisdom is much grief. And much fear of the Lord is much grief? How so? When you sin against the Lord, like another brother said in one of the comments, when you sin against God and disobey what he says, you're actually showing hate for him. Okay? Because remember, our Lord's not making you do what he says. You have to make the right choices. And see, all sin is willful sin. With very rare exception. Very rare. Like someone dupes you or uh, deceives you and then you sin unknowingly. That is rare when someone deceives you like that. Okay? All sin is a choice. Regardless. Okay? So when we willfully sin, having the fear of the Lord, it's like, oh, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So yes, the fear of the Lord could be a grief. Yes. 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 And having fear of the Lord doesn't mean that you're so terrified that you don't step outside your door and don't do anything. The fear of the Lord is what? Wisdom. And that leads unto what? Understanding the parting from evil. It doesn't mean that you sit in a fetal position in the fear of the Lord with the dra uh, drapes drawn, uh, locked up, so, you know, you're peeing down your leg, afraid to go out or do anything. No. No. It's to fear the Lord and to depart from evil. But see, when we do what is evil, sin, it grieves us. It doesn't grieve you. 
Are you saved? If, you're, if you claim to be saved and of the church of the living God, and you're doing something that is knowingly sin, and that God speaks against, and you do it anyway, and there's no prick in your heart about it, there are some who do. And they are pricked. But they keep doing it anyway. That's between you and the Lord. That's between you and the Lord. But yes, for in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge, knowing, increaseth sorrow. How so? See, unlike heretics like Mark the Messenger and those his poor, sad, deceived disciples, okay, what's their righteousness? Well, I don't eat pork. I'm keeping the law. I'm doing this. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The more that I read this book, the scriptures, the more I realize that I can't do it. The more you read, the more you learn of our Father, the more that in Scripture He shows you of truth, the more you come to the real realization. The more that you come to the real, real realization. Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. Oh, wretched man that I am. At our best state, we are altogether vanity. And the more that you read the scriptures, and much knowledge, and he that increaseth knowledge, increaseth sorrow, Lord, I can't live up to that. Oh, Lord, I can't do I fail at this. I failed at that. Lord. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body? Excuse me. Excuse me, as some of you, my enemies, pointed out. Here. <laughs> Here, okay? That's what happens when you get close to 50 years of age. Okay, see? <laughs> Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, that's pretty negative, isn't it? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. What does that mean? Meaning that with your mind you follow what God says in the scriptures. Pertinent for us today in this dispensation. But realizing that you cannot cease from sin. He's not saying it's okay to sin. But he's at peace. Realizing that at my best state I am altogether vanity. I cannot be sinlessly perfect. So what? That makes us to thank God. God, even though I sin against you every day, but I come to you and repent every day, and you forgive me according to your word, I thank you, Lord, so that, so that you can have peace. Yes, you are going to sin every day. And you say you don't sin every day. You lie and your breath stink, and I can smell it all the way over here. You lying scoundrel devil, repent. And go away. Sinlessly perfect. Give me a break. You couldn't be that even if your life, even if someone was holding a gun on your wife or your daughter, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. See, that's why Jesus Christ, He is our liberty. He is our liberty through His, through His charity which is self-sacrifice. And through his self-sacrifice, we have freedom. Charity and liberty are two different things, not one and the same. Watch out for pompous little boys who tell you otherwise. Okay? But see, Jesus Christ, he is our hope. He is our life. He is the blessed hope. But all men seek their own. Not the things which be of Christ Jesus. Or of Jesus Christ, excuse me. Why do you pray? Why do you pray? For forgiveness? Amen. Forgive me of my sins that I sin today. Okay? Well, Brad, you're already saved. You're eternally secure. Why ask for forgiveness? 
why ask for forgiveness? Okay? I don't want the Lord to deprive from me a blessing of His mercy and grace. And the way that I serve Him reflects Him. And if you claim to be saved of the church of the living God, and you go on and sin and don't, it's like, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. What kind of example are you setting to people? Huh? Come on. What? Granted, granted, the dumbest question uh, is the one that isn't asked, but there are some pretty stupid questions out there, and we are to avoid foolish questions. Okay? But all men seek their own, not the things that be of Jesus Christ. Why do we allow Christians pray? Why? Well, here's a good example. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Come on, fingers work with me. James chapter 4. And this right here is what modern Christendom does. Because modern Christendom has you. Everything revolves around you. Okay? Like some of these heretics out there who say, well, we're the only ones. And everything revolves around them. They are the only ones preaching truth. It all revolves around you, huh? Right. James chapter 4, verses 1 on verse 3. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Well, if I had more money, then I could be of more use to God. Now shut up. Shut up. We're broke. Okay? We're broke. Praise the Lord. Uh, the bills are paid. Uh, you know, but right now for this month, we're broke. Huh? And yet, what? The Lord isn't using us? No, you, you want that stuff for your lusts. And that's what Christianity gives you. It has you in its center. And Christianity in itself is all about itself. Not Jesus Christ. Because you go to the church buildings. They preach to you tithing, right? Tithing, which is not a requirement for this dispensation. Because there is no temple. There is no building. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay? They don't rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? It's all about them. And what the Christians in the buildings, why they teach you. It's, it's a Christianity that has you... In the middle of everything, it revolves around you. Like you're the be all end all of all things. <laughs> and and <laughs> come on. Prove me I'm wrong. Well, we do good things. Yeah, so you can boast about them. Why do you pray? Why? Why do you pray? Jeremiah chapter 6. Some familiar verses. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 6. This is today. Now, Jeremiah chapter 6, doctrinally and dispensationally, was talking about the Jews and for the Jews. Okay. And this is before Nebuchadnezzar came and whooped the snot out of Jerusalem. But there's some instruction on righteousness that is just so rich here. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 9, on to verse, uh, what do we want? 17. This is pertinent for today. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning, that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, they cannot hearken. 
Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. That's heresy. You, you don't need to keep the law today to say saved. That's heresy. You can eat pork. Blasphemy! <laughs> okay. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall, shall be taken and aged with him that is full of days. What the? It's full of days. Okay. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, said the Lord. And their houses and wives have been turned unto others. Others such as the Vatican and the Jesuit order. The servants of Satan. And all her little daughters. And right here, verse 13. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. Christianity is the religion of covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know, these Christians say, love is love. <laughs> love is love, meaning that it's okay to have sodomite relationships as a Christian. Well, black lives matter. You know some of the most compelling arguments against black lives matter have come from Hamites who said, Hey, these guys, they didn't do anything for us. They don't take care of our own. They don't do anything for the kindred of Ham. That came from Hamites themselves. The greatest rebukes against Black Lives Matter came from the Hamites themselves. Yeah. But were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay. Nay. <laughs> they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I will that I shall at the time I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Stand ye in the ways. That's what we're supposed to do. And see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. They don't want to hear. Also I sent watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet, but they said, you will not hearken. What happens? What happens when you get a people who have been presented the clear gospel and have been warned and have been warned? According to scripture, you are a child of disobedience. When you hear the gospel, just one time, and reject it. You're a child of wrath. You're a child of disobedience. You heard the truth, but you reject it. Therefore, you're a child of wrath. The wrath of God is upon you. His love isn't for you. His love is for you if you go to Him the way of the cross, the way He chose. Okay? He chose the way of the cross. Hence, you go the way of the cross, then you are part of the chosen. Yes, that go to the cross, which is comprised of both Jew and Gentile. Okay? Where there is no distinction in salvation. Okay? Whether you're a Demokami or a Republican, whether you're white, whether you're black, or chartreuse, whatever. Okay? Doesn't matter. You go the way of the cross and you come to him broken, contrite and in fear of him. Call upon his name and he save you. You're part of the body of Christ, sealed until the day of redemption. There is no distinction in salvation, unlike so many want to tell you today. 
the distinction is going the way that the Lord chose, the way of the cross. Okay? <laughs> All right, what are we going to do? Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 13 on to verse 19. And now, because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, which ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh, speaking specifically about the Jews. But how many of you trust you are saved because you just believed and you ain't saved? How many believe you are saved because you're elect and don't have to do anything about it? And you're not saved. And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore, Here's the, here's the scary part, brethren. Here's the scary part. Therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a, a, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. A person, which is a spirit, soul, or body, and body, or nation, can go past the point of no return. Where the only thing the Lord now this is a different dispensation, but there comes a point in someone in a nation where they go past the point of no return and they're they're gone. I know several like that who have gone past the point of no return. They 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 can't be saved. Not that the Lord can't save them, but they've gone past the point of no return. Their heart is harder than the upper millstone. They can't go back. And all today, I mean, and we're going to get to, we're going to get to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to get to that. Okay, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But someone who has made themselves an enemy of Jesus Christ. We love our enemies today in this dispensation by telling them the truth. But when someone has gone past that point of no return, they are our enemies. What do you do? How do you pray? If you must, if you're like, well, I want to pray for my enemy who hates the Lord and would kill me with a baseball bat or run me over with a car if he had the chance, whose heart is gone, harder than the upper millstone, he can't come back, I want to pray for him. Okay, you know how you pray? Pray that uh, destruction come upon him. Because maybe that is the only way that they may be saved. Okay? And you know what? Praying for someone's um, destruction is not a death sentence, Lottie. Okay, it's not. Because in that, they can turn and repent. Okay, it's not a death sentence. It's not. It's not. Besides, they've already given themselves over to death. They are in agreement with hell. Okay? But let's finish this out because we'll get... How many of you are uh, saying, would say, hey, 1 Timothy chapter 2? We'll, we'll get to that, okay? But let's continue here. Verse 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? <laughs> the children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Roman Catholic Mary, oh, excuse me, the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, saith the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the confusion of their own faces? And God is not the God of uh, confusion. God is not the author of confusion. See, our Lord is saying here that the people in Jeremiah's day, a majority of them, had gone past that point of no return. And there was no coming back. The only merciful, th the long suffering of the Lord 
You wicked devils, you're alive today. You can breathe. You have today that you might come to repentance and contrition and fear of the Lord and call upon His name and that He might save you. Okay? You have today. But when His long-suffering reaches its end, God's long-suffering, by the way, will reach its end when the redemption of the purchased possession happens. And then that seven years' time of Jacob's trouble where God is going to be pouring His wrath upon this earth for seven years. His long-suffering for you devils can end when He allows you to die. When your sin comes back and shoots you in the foot. These people had gone past the point of no return. The Lord was telling Jeremiah, hey, these people are gone. I have no choice. I have no choice. Because God is a righteous God. God is a God of judgment. Okay? Okay? But now, okay, what you're all getting at is what not all of you, because, you know, those of you truly saved, you understand this. But the, you know, don't judge. <laughs> don't judge. Oh, got some sins you're trying to hide, huh? First Timothy chapter 2, okay? First Timothy chapter 2, okay? And again, you, you, go, you go ahead in Ezekiel chapter 18, me, all day, all night, if you want. What's the, what's the preface to it? That they repent. Okay? God would rather be merciful, yes. But He wants all men to come to repentance. Christianity. God loves you. God's not angry at you. You're a good person. Easy believism. Uh, just believe. What about repentance? Oh, that's a work. Or, you're one of the chosen ones. Uh, you're elect or non-elect. Another form of Calvinism. Oh, oh good people talking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 6. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. See, see, Brad? Yeah. For kings. Yeah. And for all that are in authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Well, that's self-centered. No. no. We pray for the government and our rulers. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For what purpose? So that we can have a prosperity? No. 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 Second Corinthians chapter 5. And all things, uh, verses 18 on to verse 20, on to verse 20. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are, we are ambassadors. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So we pray for a quiet and peaceable life that we may live in all godliness and honesty when the world, America, is dishonest and not godly. See, we pray for that so that we may live our lives according to the scriptures so that we can be ambassadors unto Christ amongst the lost. What happens when those lost people have gone past that point of no return? Individually in America, there are still people that can be reached with the gospel. There are still people that the Lord is going to save. Absolutely. But on a scale, on a national scale, it's not going to happen. You, what, you praying for Smoking Joe and President Kamala Harris? They work for Satan, the Jesuits. You pray for them? 
have they done nothing but bring chaos and bedlam to America? And you pray for them. They've made their choice. They're sold out to the Vatican. They are agents of Satan. They have made their choice. Joe Biden's a Catholic. Okay? President Harris, she's a Jesuit. Trained by Jesuits. Okay? <laughs> They're the enemy. They've made their choice. Joe Biden has gone past the point of no return. He cannot be saved. Not that the Lord can't save him. But he has gone past the point of no return. He has sold himself out to Satan. Kamala Harris, she has gone past the point of no return. She, she works for the Jesuits. She has sold herself out to the Jesuit order. There's no hope for those people. There's no hope for those people. Should we continue to pray that uh, for... Uh, yes, I do believe we should. I do believe we should. I do. Why? So that we continue as long as the Lord allows to be ambassadors unto the lost. That that one person that you might encounter, the Lord might save him. Or her. So absolutely. But see, when a nation or a man goes past that point of no return, Oh, and let's finish this. Verse 4. Uh, okay, uh, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Yes, to be uh, ambassadors for Him. That's why we are praying for our kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead, lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty amongst a dishonest world and an ungodly world. Okay? For it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Well, who will have all men to be saved? You lying devils. You Calvinistic devils. With your elect and non-elect. Your chosen and unchosen. God will have all men to be saved. All men. Not everybody is going to be saved. Why? Because too many like to boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. Jesus Christ is the door. you got to go to God through what He chose His way. Okay? Who will have all men to be saved and come, to, come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. But not everybody's going to go that way, are they? No, they are not. No, they are not. And go to Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. Okay. Jeremiah 15. Yeah, you, you, you insist on praying for someone who has made their choice and served Satan. Pray that God destroys them. Pray that God puts them on a sinking submarine. Because that's the only hope they got. If any. But Jeremiah chapter 15. Verses 1 and verse 6. Then said the Lord unto me. Though Moses and Samuel stood before me. Yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight. And let them go forth. <laughs> Why? And it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, Whither shall we go forth? Then thou shalt tell them, Thus saith the Lord, Such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as are for famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. Okay? And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. And I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 
for that which he did in Jerusalem. Interesting thing there about Manasseh. Manasseh is in heaven. He's, he's saved. He turned. He repented. But see, the damage he did could not be undone. Manasseh is in heaven. Absolutely. But see, what he did, uh, the damage he did, was irreversible. And because of that, the people had gone past the point of no return. Though Moses or Samuel stood before them. And you read about Moses, okay? And Samuel, yeah? God says, if Moses or Samuel were here, his mind couldn't be for these people. Why? Why is that? Why is that? For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? For thou hast forsaken me. Saith the Lord, Thou art gone backward. Therefore will I stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. Want to know what this boils down to? Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And that man of sin, the son of perdition, who I believe uh, is going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. Okay, brother? I believe, okay, is going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. He's going to come in peaceably, speaking smooth things, prophesying deceits, promising peace, peace, and there is no peace. Okay? What it boils down to is uh, Isaiah chapter 5. This is 20 on to verse 23. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put light for, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's it in a nutshell. That's America in a nutshell. That's Christianity in a nutshell. And of course, of course, Ezekiel chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 14, and Ezekiel chapter 14, Verses 12 on to verse 20. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and will break the staff of, of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Oh, famine for America is coming! Uh, a lot of America, we are eating the store from yesteryear. And what was that Joe, Smoking Joe, uh, said something about uh, giving money to farmers to not grow or something like that? Famine is coming. Are you prepared? <laughs> Verse 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, said the Lord God. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that it be de desolate, and no man pass through because of the beasts. Beasts at Ephesus, and the, um, uh, the harlot is on every corner shouting she is loud and stubborn and abideth not in her house the Catholics uh, Mystery Babylon and all her daughters evangelizing the world unto Satan okay <clears throat> yeah though these three men were in it as I live saith the Lord God they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters they only shall be delivered but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land, steal of the Jesuit poniard, okay, and say, sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, 
They shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves, or if I send a pestilence into that land, and pour out my fury upon it in blood, to cut off from it man and beast. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. <laughs> America today, they don't want, America doesn't want the truth. The majority of the people out there, they don't want the truth. They want to hear, they want to have their ears itched. They want to hear smooth things. They want to hear God loves you. There's no going back for America. There's no revival of uh, people coming to truth. But there is going to be a revival of evil. So what do we do? How do we pray? How do you pray? Turn now to Daniel. I want us to just read together. Read this with me. One of the, like I said, the scriptures is full of prayers, especially the Psalms. You know, you got the Lord's Prayer, uh, Gen uh, John chapter 17, which is the actual Lord's Prayer, okay? But go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel. This thing about Daniel. This thing about Daniel, okay? This thing about Daniel. Let's remember about Daniel. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 10 and 11. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Daniel was a man greatly beloved. He, the Lord gave him visions. The Lord and my wife and I were talking about this this morning, about how Daniel was r rescued from the lions. The lions didn't touch him. Okay, him and the three children of Israel, uh, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, Daniel was a man greatly beloved, greatly beloved, who prayed to the Lord three times a day when it was against the law for a small time to pray as he had been praying. But see, they set that up so that they could uh, take him, uh, hand him over, okay? But see, Daniel was a man greatly beloved. He wasn't defiled by the king's meat. He, uh, the law said, you can't pray. He prayed. Three times, excuse me, three times a day. He prayed. He was a man greatly beloved. But remember how I mentioned to you about the thing about the umbrella, about how a lot of these Christians want to hide themselves under that and say, well, we're all sinners, but they want to be separate. Well, we're all sinners, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Okay? Let's look at the prayer of Daniel here. Beautiful. Beautiful. A humble, godly man. Daniel chapter 3. Verses 3 on to verse 19. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Fasting, sackcloth and ashes. Ashes, they would put them on their head, rub it in their hair, because from dust thou art unto dust thou shalt return. It was a sign of mourning, okay? And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Right away, acknowledging the righteous judgment of God. Okay? We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from the precepts and from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Now see right there, verse 5, he's saying we. Okay? See, the heretic will say, well, we're all sinners, putting themselves under that umbrella. But when, are, when they are pressed, they detract to separate themselves 
well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. That, okay, that's what they do. What Daniel is doing, we have sinned. He is counting himself of that number, even though, and we just read it, he was a man greatly beloved. Even though Daniel was a man greatly beloved and had visions of the Almighty, okay, absolutely, and had understanding of dreams, greatly beloved, yet, yet, he was accounting himself amongst them. Even though he was a man greatly beloved. Even though he was a man greatly beloved. Okay? When I've prayed for America, I say we. Because I am an American. I'm not associated. I'm separate other than that. But I am an American. We here in America, we have, we have done this, you know? But then again, America has gone past the point of no return. But see, what Daniel is doing, he's not hiding himself in order to eventually exclude himself. No, he is putting himself within that number. How many of you people who make America great again, how many of you are willing to pray like this? Who prays like this? Those who are saved, born again, converted to the church of the living God. When making intercession for a lost man, a lost person, spirit, soul, and body. Or a mercy for a nation that we might have another day to reach whomever the Lord will want us to reach. That's who prays like that. You Christians, who all, all you're concerned about is your careers, and your, your houses, your lands, and your, your, your reputation, your name and stuff. Yeah. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants and prophets, which spake in the name, in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our, P, our, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. In this Daniel is admitting, Lord, I still sin. Okay? Even he, yes, even Daniel, still sin. Not perfect. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. But today, Christianity, you have your own righteousness because you believe or you do this, that, or the other thing. It's not your righteousness. And those of us who are truly saved, born again, converted, we know that. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day. To the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near, and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them. Because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against them. Who prays like this? Do you? To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against them. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets, and the law. If you broke one point of the law, you broke it all. And there was no man, no person, spirit's own body, that could ever keep the law perfectly, except one, who just happened to be Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh could keep the perfect, uh, could keep the uh, commandments perfectly. Even though the flesh that was sinful tempted him against it. Okay? But see, God can't be tempted with evil. Okay? The flesh was the... Uh, all temptation was in the flesh. But see, God within flesh, who kept the law perfectly. Okay? God's the only one who could do it. See here. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws. Daniel's admitting, hey, I do my best. But I break your commandments every day. You break one, you've broken them all. Okay? Yay. 
All Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And even though he was uh, greatly beloved, because of them, he was suffering too. You get it? And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us, by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done unto Jerusalem. Read Lamentations sometime. The apple of his eye. Right here again. You know, Lord, you warned this was going to happen. And we did it anyway. Do what you will. You're going to do what you will. You said you were going to do this to us, and you're doing it to us, and we deserve it. Why do you pray? Oh, so you can get just get something? Or to have fellowship with your Father? Do you pray for others? Or are you the be-all, end-all of your prayers? Why do you pray? Just to get something, a uh, worldly possession? Or to have fellowship with your Father? As is it was written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Oh. Yet, made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hast gotten thee renowned as at this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. Including himself in that. He was a man greatly beloved. Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins, and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Yea, Lord, yea, Lord, still abortion, uh, people are murdered here every day, uh, sodomite marriage, this is a land of sin, Lord, please, have mercy on us today here in America, Lord, that we might be used of you, that you might still be present here to save who you will. Have mercy, Lord. Don't destroy us today. That you may be glorified, that you may save still someone in this nation who you want to save. I, do you pray like that? Do we pray like that, brethren? Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate, for the Lord's sake. And right here, look, get a load of this. O God, O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes, and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness. For our righteousness is but for thy great mercies. Lord, we're a righteous, I'm a righteous man. Why are you doing this to me? Oh Lord, America, this is a God-fearing nation. Oh, we're such a great nation. Have mercy on us. So Jesus is just a genie in the bottle to you, huh? Now what God is answering your prayers? O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not. For thine own sake, O oh my God. For the city and thy people that uh, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And remember in 2 Thessalonians, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who prays like this? 
so I mean, we we could have expounded on this for a four-hour video. <laughs> but read that. Who prays like that? Who's willing to put themselves in that place in order to pray for basically a nation that has stuffed their nose to the Lord and are doomed? Who prays like this? And remember, though Daniel, Noah, and Job were in this place, they would deliver only themselves. That's what America has become. That's what man is. And that's the revival of evil, the revival of self that is coming. You pray like that. There was a little things for himself in there, yes, but Daniel was not the focal point of his prayer. He included himself. But see, that was a prayer for others. And most importantly, that was a prayer unto his father, whom he had fellowship with. Do you pray like that? Can you pray like that? Can you pray like that? Because remember, it's not all about you. You ask my dear beloved brother, my best friend Alexander Hartley, you ask him about it not being all about him. It's not all about us, brethren. It's about our Father. It's about our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you pray? That's going to be it for this video. Like I said, this was something uh, uh, the past couple of days. <laughs> uh, I have a heart condition. And I, I, I'm not going to know Jesuit doctor. And besides, uh, the Jesuits know who I am. I've been threatened by Jesuits. And I'm afraid, I'm not afraid, but if I, you know, I got a wife, I'm not going to the Jesuits for healing. Do healthy stuff. And still, I do take some supplements. Uh, there was a brother who was talking about against supplements, and he's right. You know, a healthy diet ought to replace supplements. But uh, anyway, my heart has been giving me a lot of problems the past couple of days. And any of you who do have heart problems, you know, sleep is, um, sleep is a treasure, is a jewel. And my sleep has just been horrible the past couple of days. And today, the Lord actually gave me sleep. I got rest. You know, my wife is like, well, you slept pretty late, but good, praise the Lord. Uh, but anyway, this was something that, one of those things where I woke up, with uh, the prayer of Daniel. The prayer of Daniel. Our weapons are mighty, not carnal. In pulling down strongholds and casting down imaginations. We fight with the sword of the Spirit. And we fight with prayer. And we have to put on every piece of the whole armor of God, people. Not just one part and leave the rest undone. you got to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the fiery darts of the devil. Hey, you got somebody that you haven't talked to for a while, huh? Reach out to them. Reach out to him or her. Hey, how you doing? Can I, is there a way I can pray for you? Pray for one another. Pray for one another. It's what we got. Want a good example of prayer? Read Psalms. 
But that prayer of Daniel, boy. I'd like to tell you that I pray like that all the time. I don't. I don't. When my heart's acting up on me, my, yeah, everything revolves around me because I don't want to leave my wife. I don't want to leave her, leave her behind. She would be taken care of. But that's not the point. I'm supposed to be doing it. It's not up to me. It's not all about me. Thank you to those of you who pray for us. We need all the prayers you can get. Or you can give us, excuse me. We need all the prayers you can give us. And thank you to those of you who help us, who support us. Thank you. Without the Lord through you. And see, many of my enemies have tried to prevent that from happening. But we're still here. Thank you. We love you. And there are those of you who I've not talked to in a while. We, we pray. We pray. Don't think you're forgotten. We love you. Thank you for watching this if you do. We'll see you in the next video. Lord willing, Monday we're going to talk a little bit about this good person thing. In depth. As the Lord wills. He might have something else. You know why? Because this isn't about me. This isn't a one man show. Well you only see me here. Yes. But this isn't. This is the body of Christ. This isn't about me. This isn't a one man show. So. Going to get this uploaded. It's uh, 141 my time. I love you. Thank you.